you Counter Extremism Project and, and RAN for hosting this excellent event. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to do this sort of transatlantic, even in the uh, era of COVID. Um, as you heard from Alexander, you know, Jesse and I looked at this issue um, and, and did some research and came out with our report in December 2018. And of interest, you know, we've been working together for more than three years now. And, you know, just to give a little bit of background, uh, in our previous careers, um, we were on other sides of the table where my team at NYPD was investigating uh, Jesse's group, you know, on the counterterrorism side. Um, but it's a real, you know, pleasure to be able to work with someone who had that diametrically opposed view uh, so we can better understand from which direction we're approaching these, these issues. Um, so, you know, the idea with this report was really to understand that, you know, since 2001 and 9-11, there have been, you know, 900 plus arrests uh, in the U.S. related to counterterrorism. And, you know, given the legal construct in the U.S. and the way that people who are sentenced for terrorism related crimes, you know, generally we're talking about 20 year plus terms. So unlike Europe, we were sort of able to postpone thinking about this issue of former terrorists being released for the close to 20 years. And in fact, just last year, um, you know, you had some of the first uh, arrests like John Walker Lynn relating back to 9-11 coming out of prison. But, you know, we thought that we needed to take a look at this given that the 20 year window had, had just about passed and the numerator was high, um, you know, 500 uh, domestic and international terrorists incarcerated in the U.S. And the fact that in now and coming years, a significant proportion of them will be released. Um, it's sort of the iron rule of, of imprisonment is that unless, you know, you're away from life, you will return to society. And, you know, what we saw in the U.S. is that there really was no program per se uh, to deal with this phenomena. And, you know, another dynamic in thinking about the people who were going to be released was just their age. Uh, since with the whole ISIS phenomena, so many of these individuals, uh, you know, were relatively young, um, you know, they were going to get out um, still with a potential um, part of their life where they could be productive members of society. Now, we know there have been a lot of studies out there done on recidivism rates. You know, we, we've been following uh, the, the Tom Renard study and others, um, you know, which show rates of recidivism for former terrorists 5% uh, and lower. That said, there are also some studies out there that show some very different data. And I'm talking about um, the Horgan Mary Beth Altier study, you know, where they saw recidivism rates you know, close to 64%. And also we're familiar with the Guantanamo data that shows about 17% of releasees get back into the fight. So, you know, while that question as to what is the precise accurate number for recidivism rates still is sort of an unknown, our view is that, look, it's gonna be greater than zero. We have this numerator in the United States uh, and in Europe, obviously, it's even a bigger, you know, numerator, people coming out. So it's something that we needed to get in front of policymakers uh, in the U.S. And we thought this study could be the first step, which I mentioned was supported by the Counter-Extremism Project. What's also of interest in the U.S. and a bit of a new phenomena, you know, on our side of the Atlantic is the rising proportion of right-wing extremists who are also part of the equation, though not included in our study. Next slide, Jesse. So, you know, I mentioned, you know, this sort of immutable, what we call this iron law of imprisonment, because unless you're gonna die in prison, uh, everyone will return home uh, at some point. So it, it just sort of underpins and underscores why we thought this study was important. Uh, to embark upon. And, you know, we tried to look at data that was available. We tried to look at the programs that were available in different countries who have experimented with post-prison rehabilitation, 
frankly, Germany being one of the you know, leading countries in having a wide diversity of different programs, um, but also looking you know, at, at the UK and, and Denmark and Netherlands and, and some other countries as well. Um, and what we also were able to do, which I think was sort of unique, is given uh, you know, Jesse's unique history uh, and familiarity, frankly, with um, the federal prison system, is that we were able to speak to uh, or be in communication with 10 violent extremist offenders who were still serving their time. So to get their perspective, literally, while they're still behind bars uh, and put that into the equation here, as well as talking with the U.S. probation's uh, office at the federal level, uh, people in the uh, Department of Justice and uh, other governmental agencies. Next slide. So, you know, what did we find? Big picture, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there will be this new challenge. The U.S. is unprepared for it because we don't have anything programmatic at the federal level, at the state level, and really even at the local level. Um, like I mentioned, you know, recidivism, while we don't know precisely what to expect, uh, it'll be some number greater than zero. And, you know, with that in mind, we think there is a strong impetus to have some type of program that limits the likelihood of recidivism. And we think that's a rehabilitation and reentry program for violent extremist offenders, for all different ideologies. Um, you know, there is a concern when you're in the CVE space, and, and certainly in the UK, in the US, um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's been this issue from the right, you know, are you trying to do, is this a hugging a terrorist program? And I would argue, no. In fact, it's really a program based on self-interest and sort of hard counterterrorism. If you're trying to reduce that recidivism rate and the potential for violence that we saw, frankly, two horrific examples of in the UK in December of last year and in February of this year, um, you know, it, it's in your counterterrorism um, best interest to put some program in type of in place to try and prevent or limit recidivism. Um, so what are we suggesting? We think it's a voluntary program. Uh, we think it's, there's a portion that happens while you're in prison and before you're released. And then there's an important portion of this that happens afterward. And this has to be voluntary. You can't force somebody into these programs um, because you're going to get pushed back and it's likely to, frankly, boomerang on you. So there has to be a sort of willingness on the individual to be part of a program like this and, you know, there are incentives one could put in place to make it more attractive for them. Um, we see models in the U.S. that we can pull from, gang dropout, um, drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs. There are elements there we think that rather than creating this from a whole cloth brand new, you know, an era that it's tough to get funding for, we say, let's take programs that already exist and tweak them so that you do a pilot program that embraces some of these elements, but for violent extremist offenders. And we think that community organizations uh, have a role to play once individuals are released from prison. Next slide. So, you know, just before I hand it over to Jesse, you know, I thought it'd be worthwhile to sort of give you, um, you know, sort of an anecdotal view of what happens to someone who gets released from prison. And you know, I'm talking about Brian Neil Vinyas. He's someone who Jesse and I have both worked with. Uh, he's an American who radicalized in the United States, who traveled overseas, who made it to Afghanistan, who actually joined Al-Qaeda, Al participated in attacks against the coalition forces in Afghanistan, and was involved in Al-Qaeda Al plotting against the United States and the Long Island Railroad, and frankly was working with European jihadists, certainly Belgian and French uh, and others, you know, in, uh, in Afghanistan. So he was arrested, he came back, he ended up um, flipping and working for the U.S. government, and he participated, as you see below, in, you know, more than 100 interviews and lots of different law enforcement and intelligence agencies frankly the vast majority of them um, from western europe who were interested in who we knew who we met who were the fellow travelers there so he turned out to be a tremendous counterterrorism and intelligence asset for the u.s government 
And what happened when he got released? Food stamps and Medicaid. So these are social assistance programs um, that, that help people, but they're really the bare minimum. Um, and, you know, he was really sort of at, at lost, not knowing what to do. And when you think about, you know, if you're trying to prevent someone from being re-radicalized or going down a recidivist road, um, all the things that were not done for him sort of created a perfect storm where I could have easily seen him gone down that road. Next slide, Jesse. Thanks. So, you know, pre-release, he received no type of de-radicalization programming, whether it was voluntary or not, it just didn't exist. There was no opportunity for him to get vocational training, any type of skill, because he essentially came as a high school dropout when he joined Al-Qaeda. No type of high school equivalent degree program he could participate in, and no mental health programming. Um, so there was no plan for him when he was released. Yes, you know, there was, um, you know, surveillance in a sense by virtue of a probation officer, the FBI, and a judge. So there were um, safety, you know, safety nets built in to prevent him or to watch him in case he turned back to violent extremism, but nothing to sort of give him a pathway. Um, and in fact, there were inhibitors. Um, he was put in a three-quarters house. So essentially, he was put in a, in a house in a neighborhood that he described to me as more concerning to him uh, than when he was in Afghanistan, you know, on the run from predator drone strikes because it was sort of in a, in a slop. Um, he had no social security card, which is really sort of one of the key things you need if you're going to get any type of job, no birth certificate. So really starting from scratch, no funds. As many formers who are released from prison, you know, he was alienated from his family, so there was no support network. Um, and of course, you know, there for security reason, wasn't allowed to be on the internet or have a smartphone. So some of the means and mechanisms to try and pursue work were all, um, you know, uh, prevent, he was prevented access to those. Fortunately, you know, Jesse and I began to work with him. Um, he had a good attitude. He now uh, got himself uh, a job in construction and essentially participated in uh, vocational training programs. So he received certain licenses um, and now is working full time, um, you know, has his own apartment and uh, is, is on the road to a better life um, for himself that he's reconstructed. But really, you know, US government um, didn't do anything for him. And this could have been a story that, that went the wrong way, went the way that some of these incidents, you know, that happened in the UK in December and February have gone. So let me hand things over there to, to Jesse that will walk you through, he'll walk you through some more details of our findings and, re and recommendations. Thank you, Mitch, and thank you to Alexander and Hans for the kind introductions, and we're honored to be here uh, with RAND, Radicalization Awareness Network, and on behalf of the Counter Extremism Project, who, without their support, uh, this research and the programming that we've pursued since then uh, would not be possible. Um, I'm going to walk through briefly the recommendations of our report, the findings, but I'm going to concentrate on how we've transformed those findings and formulated the basis for a grassroots initiative here in the United States that can pursue additional uh, intervention efforts, support efforts, despite the fact that at the time we don't have uh, governmental support for programming uh, in a wide uh, sense at all. Uh, transitioning our findings and the conversations with the 10 people that were behind bars, the 10 people that were released, some of whom we were supporting, um, we decide that we, with regard to in-prison programming, that it is very uh, important to figure out exactly how we might provide some form of de-radicalization or disengagement inducing programming while incarcerated for terrorism related offenders. We did a comprehensive review of the policies, the protocols and the procedures that have been implemented thus far. Many of them track well with other countries, but in the United States, essentially when there has started to be an increase in arrest, they started a process where they called communication management units. Communication management units are basically isolation for extremist offenders. And they caused some complications. For example, a co-defendant of mine in the past was housed with uh, Ahmad Musa Jabril, who was incarcerated there as well. In that sense, Ahmad Musa Jabril became the uh, inmate uh, imam. 
went on to become one of the chief radicalizers and recruiters. So we have to look at recidivism from a broader lens and defining it because you might not recidivate with regard to return to terrorism, but you also may go up, out and continue to promote an ideology and be able to do so in a more effective manner. So we looked at other alternatives that could be utilized apart from isolation units, but treatment units essentially. We do agree that there should be some incentive uh, to participate, but that participation should be voluntary in nature. Um, and we looked at the substance abuse initiatives that are utilized for offenders. They get a year off of their sentence if they participate in a, what they call a RDAP program. It's empirically validated. It concentrates on some of the issues that revolve around addiction. But in many ways, the literature on research into radicalization, particularly the space of trauma and pre-radicalization factors is starting to show that ideologies function a lot like addictions. And we pull a lot from that with regard to the recommendations. And then I was privy to be incarcerated in a facility that was for gang members that had dropped out and were moved from maximum security prisons to a nicer facility where they were actually engaged with former gang members that are doing lifetime in prison, that were serving as peer-to-peer -peer counselors and working with a multidisciplinary team. It's a pilot initiative inside of the Federal Bureau of Prison System, which few people know about. But we pulled from that and we outlined some things that we can talk about in the uh, Q&A due to limited time restrictions about what should happen before release. We recommend that the United States government, you need government involvement in this space and that they should partner with a community-led program or community-led programs to develop post-release re-entry programs for terrorism-related offenders. Community-driven countering violent extremism initiatives should be preferred to government-led approaches. We need, you, you have much more flexibility there, much more knowledge of localized communities, the networks, the needs, the, uh, the narratives. The non-governmental partner uh, would have intimate contact with what is happening on the ground, as I said, and the community-led partner would begin to work with inmates while incarcerated and develop trust. We recommend that that should start at least six months before release and continue upon release, and that the community-led partner would provide services tailored for release. So we recommend one-on-one -on -one mentorship, mentee release. We, rec we recognize that community-level partners can impart a broader awareness amongst probation officers and those tasked with monitoring post-release. And we talk a little bit about that in the report specifically, in particular. We also recognize that in every country, we identify what are termed in the literature radicalization hubs. So when localized pro pilot programs may be appropriate in, in, in districts, comprehensive localized uh, programs might be appropriate in districts in the United States. For example, New York City, Minneapolis, and Northern Virginia represent probably the largest clusters of what we would refer to as radicalization. Uh, uh, we still think that we should reduce the burden off government actors and courts by developing community-led uh, initiatives. We also think that they should create something akin to a health information exchange for disengagement and de-radicalization. If we're going to develop effective risk assessment tools, re-entry needs responsivity tools tailored to violent extremists, we're going to have to have access to the data. Um, and we, uh, we recommend enabling the provision of specialized assistance even in localities where there are few extremists. And so we, Looking at the United States ambit, the limited number of terrorism-related offenders and the broad geographical space that the United States occupies, we think that there needs to be a national level community initiative that works in partnership with localized outfits. And we've been moving, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that we've been moving to achieve that. We also think that in the United States, we have some leverage in the court system that's not being currently utilized in ways that it is with offenders such as substance abusers and sex offenders. We think that in certain cases, at the discretion of the judge and based upon sentencing reports and then reports prior to release, that there is an option in the U.S. that fits into our legal framework where mandated participation in a program would increase the likelihood that early indicators of return to extremist commitment or of mobilization to violence could be better identified. There is evidence uh, to suggest the connection between mandated uh, program participation and a reduction in recidivism in other realms, and we think that that's worthy of pursuit. We also think that a community-based program should utilize a multidisciplinary team, that the community-led program should provide in-house mentoring uh, to reinforce disengagement, promote de-radicalization, reduce stigma, and protect the public. Protect the public being key. It can't just be about the offender. It also has to be about guaranteeing that the recidivism and the risk factors and the indicators associated with it are identified and developing a better capacity to do that. And for us, based on our experience, even before we published the report and our ability to access a population that very few could uh, access and achieve, we really do believe that former extremists can play an important role as interventionists. But in some of our experiences, we've learned that the focus of uh, former extremists and their utilization should not be 
a primary care provider, but if they are cultivated with better case management skills where they can build uh, rapport with an individual that they're working with, we've literally had to formulate what we're calling the Center for the Study of Trauma and Radicalization so that we can get mental health professionals that are learning from our formers about the ideology and applying trauma and violence informed care approaches to provide supportive services and care. And then you get a multi-sectoral sectoral learning capacity built in where the different sectors of our society at the community level, former level, law enforcement level, and then hopefully government buy-in as we continue to build this out and support for it can develop a cooperative learning process. So moving along from that, Final recommendations are that the community-led program should utilize a network of vetted former extremists that those in the program can engage with to share uh, common experiences. For those without family support, this network can provide the same sense of meaning, purpose, and identity extremist networks provide their recruits. And basically what we say with regard to our parallel networks philosophy is that when we focus on risk factors alone with regard to recidivism reduction and reintegration programming, we're missing out on some of the key variables that can be affiliated with a risk assessment. And that is there's not enough research and there's not enough information on protective factors. How do you provide the same sort of need fulfillment that extremists provide their recruits? And Parallel Networks philosophy believes that if you think in terms of networks and social belonging as being as important to individual predisposing characteristics, then you have to look at the setting that the individual will find themselves in upon release. And we also recognize the limitations of doing independent internal reviews. So as we build out programming and have been doing so based on our report, we strongly have come to the conclusion that independent reviews conducted by academics can create another cooperative level of learning where the academic has the objectivity coming in and is not privy or, or, or inclined to sort of document success where there is none and to take a very evidence-based approach to assessing results. And we've started to put the right academics in place to do so. So since the publishing of the report, we, uh, and based on our findings, we designed an initiative in the United States that is doing this work. We were doing it ad hoc before the report, we've started to formalize it. And without government involvement, only the support of the counter-extremism project, we've been able to achieve some interesting results. On the screen, you can see a brochure for the Alternative Pathways Program. We send this with a tailored letter to every inmate that is set for release. We start to reach out to them as recommended in the report six months before. We now have contact with over 25 people pending release from an array of violent extremist affiliations now that we're more concerned with the far right wing. We've identified individuals that might not be incarcerated for terrorism related offenders, but have a known affiliation to a far right wing extremist movement and that in other circumstances could have potentially been applied uh, terrorism enhancement while were, the, were, were, were we more focused on that area. So inmates receive this and they receive a tailored letter before they release. And it also outlines the avenue of support that we provide. But it's not really just about that. What we've been able to do is we've been able to put a multidisciplinary team, mostly of volunteers because of limited funding that has attained some really significant results, not just in the realm of providing care and support and reentry and reintegration services for those that are convicted of terrorism related offenders, but from those from other target populations that are very similar. We've now worked from the publication of the report, of the report with 18 terrorism related offenders, some foreign fighter returnees, family members, and we're in engaged and have been arrested in the past with known affiliations to violent extremist movements. Some of these include, as Mitch said, America's first, force, first foreign fighter, Bryant Neil Venus. Um, and Mitch uh, d discovered Venus in the difficult predicament that he uh, found him in. And really, it's a situation where by putting together a multidisciplinary team, we can provide the right interventions. So in the case of Bryant Neil Venus, he can't communicate with me directly because of my former conviction. And so Mitch has been providing predominant uh, guidance and support to Brian, but we have a female on staff who has a PhD in human trafficking similarities for recruitment for human trafficking networks and jihadist networks. And they have developed quite a, quite, quite a, quite a successful and productive relationship that has really facilitated and eased his, uh, his reintegration, giving him another friend, giving him another support, and she's cultivated that very well. And even to the degree where when we talk about transitioning into the provision of 
uh, alternative sense of meaning, significance, and purpose to what extremists provide. Um, really, we've developed, apart from the specific work for terrorism uh, reentry and reintegrate, terrorism related offender reentry and reintegration, our philosophy says that the work that we do in the realm of preventing and countering violent extremism, we publish, for example, an anti counter radicalization magazine quarterly called Ahapakwa. Bryant Neal Venus and others that I'll mention here have been authors in that. Bryant was able to go with Mitch and speak and tell his story in several different occasions. He's spoken on behalf of the organization. And so you're giving a person that alternative sense of meaning and purpose. They're giving them an, a, an outlet for significance. And in the process, the de-radicalization, which is a long process, which I've learned myself, you can see and you can adjust to what might become indicators of a sort of reversion to old behavior. Um, we worked with the first female ISIS affiliated uh, returnee in the United States, big publication upon her release, put her under pressure, stigmatization because she was posting what would be considered ultra fundamentalist beliefs online, not understanding the differentiation between assessing between a quietist Salafist who still retains radical beliefs and assessing between someone who's still committed to a Salafi jihadist. We were able to go in there, provide nuance use that understanding of nuance to establish rapport and to facilitate her employment, supporting her through the earliest phases of her reentry and reintegration and effectively mitigating any risk that could be associated with that case. We've worked with female foreign terrorist fighter family member returnees. The wife of one of the chief propagandists for uh, ISIS was returned with children to the United States suffered from a lot of anxiety, symptoms of PTSD. We were able to guide an approach where I worked with her as a former, and we also connected her to multidimensional, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral staff that could help with the other stuff that was going on, processing the trauma, et cetera, et cetera. And interestingly enough, in our approach of writing with Bryant Neal Venus and other terrorism-related offenders for our magazine, we were able to appeal with counter-narrative products to someone who was in Canada, who was the star of a caliphate podcast, came from ISIS, had joined ISIS, returned to Canada, was working with Canadian authorities on de-radicalization initiatives, but was working with moderate imams that didn't necessarily have a nuanced understanding of the ideology to the degree that it was imagined, and other former extremists that came about with a very aggressive, combative approach. He had essentially re-radicalized, threatened to behead me, and we've been able to establish through the Alternative Pathways Program participation that now has him at college, has him thinking about getting trauma treatment care, has him reintegrating into society a little better. And we don't even talk about the ideas because in this part, we understand that it's interaction and engagement with productive groups that will give him that new identity that can formulate over time. Another example with regard to working with the far right is that the future face of white nationalism in the US has worked with our program. That's Matt Heimbach. We get a lot of criticism for it, but we, uh, have effectively disengaged someone whose dis, whose de-radicalization process started during incarceration. Um, and uh, we can continue to go on about case studies, but we really have seen a proof of concept with regard to applying our parallel networks philosophy to this realm. We're currently writing the second assessment ever in the United States conducting an assessment on the appropriateness for an alternative to incarceration for a young man who's facing sentencing in Houston. We've developed the counter-narrative projects, as I said, that can allow them to contribute to the realm of preventing violent extremism once we walk them away and give them a new sense of belonging. We've also utilized our access to this population to start to think about building out additional programming. We've partnered with good academics, solid, solid professionals, on looking for research grants that can continue to make the findings of when terrorists come home more empirical, we'll look at uh, how we can identify new risk and protective factors with the unique access we have to this population. Um, we're developing relationships with former gang members that have been doing recidivism reduction work with gang members and are doing very uh, interesting and innovative mechanisms of providing uh, in-prison interventions in California prisons and facilitating uh, recidivism reduction programming upon release. We're currently working to develop a proposal that would serve as a course and a curriculum that inmates can take where they are susceptible to radicalization or their terrorism related convicts can be implemented by an instructor in prison settings or can be conducted through correspondence course through mailing and then can promote the alternative pathways uh, program so that when they're released, they can transition the learning that's associated with that course and curriculum into participation in the program. And interestingly enough, some of the paradigm that we've put forth is now starting to be applied 
uh, in the foreign terrorist fighter and family member returnees population. We recently utilized the parallel networks philosophy, which is based on a trauma and what we call trauma encountering violent extremism informed paradigm to discuss a theory of change associated with people returning to the West Balkans that are coming back from camps in Syria or that uh, appeared in country during a wave of uh, reverse migration, if you will, coming back from, from Syria uh, in the period 2016 to 2018. So we've been building uh, from our reports uh, and we've been uh, implementing programming around this. There is no governmental support, but we think that we're on a good path to being able to effectively one year down the road or so publish a key findings report that's much more empirical, that has validity with regard to how it can inform risk assessment tools and can lay out some ideal processes, relationships, and looking at the sort of structure and protocols and programming that people around the world can benefit from. We're very excited about this space. We recognize that it's particularly important. We started this work expecting that there would be recidivism coming in the near term. We think that as time goes on and those that have been sentenced to very long terms, uh, we do believe that the risks for recidivism increase. The cases and the demographics of the cases coming over in the United States are very different. With that, I will end uh, and I thank you for listening and we can resume in the Q&A. Thank you very much.